and uh, a victory would be awfully nice too. You'll learn. Immersive sports oh, science. Be. Content not commentary, sports science, not Jones. bro science. Tiger Woods. In back. this series, we review books, documentaries, and film, and more importantly, expand upon the scientific information. I score Tiger Woods back in 96.55, and here's why. Tiger Woods Back is a non-linear documentary focusing heavily upon his master's career. Most spectacularly, his 2019 comeback focusing on the adversity of coming back from those injuries. Although it didn't specifically look at his injuries and his personal life in massive detail, it also focused upon his earlier career and what made him the champion he is. Back followed a non-linear timeline. First of all, focusing upon his early life, giving a brief information about his personal life and him growing up. Then focusing upon his master's career, where it then flip-flopped from the Masters from the past to the 2019 Masters. The documentary, as well as the music, has been critically acclaimed. I once tried to teach my dog how to play Wonderwall. Fortunately, he was only interested in Bart. Rising up back on the street did my time, took my chance. In terms of the information, there was a heavy focus upon confidence and self belief. Confidence has become a hugely researched topic in both sport and exercise and is often seen as the most important factor mediating motivation and regulating of behavior in everyday life. Our confidence can be affected by our motivation orientations, which in turn are influenced whether our goals are intrinsic or extrinsic. And I know this is going to be incredibly cliche to everyone watching, but confidence can breed success. However, confidence also breeds more confidence. But when only one has perceptually the self-belief in their own ability, do they then potentially then have confidence? And confidence in their own ability to meet the demands of the sporting environment and the contextual situations they find themselves in. This is determined by your locus of control. This means you could be highly confident, let's say at golf, but not be confident in love or in a, a whatever other situation there is outside of the sporting environment. In order to understand self-confidence further, we need to understand the certain constructs that make up confidence. We need to understand similar yet different terms used. Self-efficacy is the belief in one's capability to succeed at tasks. Self-confidence refers to the belief in one's personal worth and likelihood of succeeding. Self-confidence is a combination of self-esteem and general self-efficacy. While self-esteem refers to the general feelings of self-worth or self-value. But all these concepts, like confidence, are highly temporal, meaning that they change over time and is also different in varying situations. Now, there are two main models we utilize to help us understand confidence in sport. That is the Integrative Model of Sport Performance by Vili 2001 and Bandura's Self-Efficacy Theory. Vili's model, if you like, is a more adaptive, more specific model for the competitive sporting environment though it does have some weaknesses as it's been modified and changed over numerous times over the 21st century. Now there are many things that determine whether you have confidence. These include organizational structure, competitive standards, motivational climate, goal and your goal expectations, personality characteristic, personal, moral and ethical values which can then influence the development and manifestation of confidence, as well as the three domains they use to source confidence. So these include achievement, self-regulation, and the social climate that you find yourself in. These ultimately influence your sporting performance by affecting your thoughts, feelings, and emotions, which almost have a direct impact upon 
your performance in game. We know that confidence can increase certain facets of play. If you're more confident, you're generally going to hit the ball harder and you also will take more calculated risks than someone who is not confident. This might be because they're not confident about certain facets of their play, like their swing, for instance, and therefore they are unwilling to take the normal actions or more risky actions. And we also know that being more confident helps with putting, believe it or not, as well. And there's also a small amount, if not conclusive research, which shows that if you're more confident, you generally hit the ball harder. Yet again, we got to bear in mind that in golf, it's a tactical game for the individual, not just a pure athletic sport. Being highly confident is great, but we don't want to be overconfident or get to the point of being anxious. Likewise, all three of those variables can affect how one perceives the course, how they interact with the course. Golf is a game between you and your social environment. However, we can reframe anxiety, even though anxiety is not a positive, we can change that to make it a positive. That is really the European view on it. The North American view is that anxiety is bad for sporting performance and we should avoid it at all costs. Confidence can also act as a self-protector. It protects you from the environment around you and also increases one's strivings, one's wants to win, one's and it can add to one's motivation. And there is a difference between confidence, determination and motivation. Anxiety is linked to arousal. Too much arousal and one will end up crashing and potentially not performing to the best of their ability. However, this 2D perspective is too simplistic and hence why models like cusp catastrophe theory exist. Now, a new way of, co of a confidence coaching approach in terms of one's actual physical performance. In this case, let, let's use putting as an example. Use of quiet eye training. Quiet eye refers to the pupil targeting focusing. Just simply having the eye on the target is not quiet eye. Having a long gaze length that is less sporadic and normally shorter times to take the shot often indicates a more elite performer. And generally they perform better at putting and you could also say driving. Quiet eye training may have a preventative factor against anxiety. This, is, this if you like, is trying to increase the autonomic response of an individual when playing golf. Tiger Woods is perceived to be the best golfer of all time, arguably. He's the man. He drives the sport. He drives our TV ratings. He drives the money all of us make that work in the sport when Tiger Woods is Tiger Woods. And that day, he just let the whole world go, yeah, no, I may be old, I may have been injured, I may have been gone, but I'm back. The reason being is because of the fast club head coming through on his drive swing, which means that he had a pretty damn accurate drive from the tee that was went pretty well far, and his putting game was absolutely phenomenal, meaning he was probably one of the best all-round golfers of all time. Likewise, as the film's title suggests, Tiger Wood back. It's referring to his multiple of injuries, mainly his, from his back itself, but also from his knee injuries. Now, someone who has suffered knee injuries in the past, all a bit from a completely different sport, my sport being the 400 meter hurdles and smashing hurdles and damaging your knees is a little bit different to golf injury, so to speak. But I understand the emotional strain it has upon you and the feeling of hopelessness. Like, if your identity is based around your sport, not being able to play that sport, well, what are you? Like, what else have you got out there? It's, it's like a feeling of loss. Really dark, dark times. I can remember looking at him and I said, yeah, but you are Tiger Woods. You, you always knew you could do it. I said, there was a lot of us that may have doubted you, but I know you. You never doubted yourself. And he actually said, no, I had doubts whether I'd ever be able to play again and to compete at the highest level because he, he just wouldn't want to play. And we see that a lot in the literature. It's, it's almost like a feeling of grievance. But when we utilize things like REBT and asking the, the individuals, the, the athletes, the importance of their sport to them, in the scale of it, is it really that important? Is it life or death? Yes, I know it's the no bullshit approach to helping someone out with their well-being, telling them, so, telling them the question is, did someone die, for instance? No, then therefore it's not as important. 
is not always the best answer to help someone with that particular situation. Sometimes you may need cognitive behavioural therapy or CBT as that may be a better option to them. That's more of the arm around the shoulder, let's have a listen to them approach. And as a result, we reframe the way they think to help them with improve their time from injury, but also when they get back onto the golf course. These feelings can lead to maladaptive coping strategies in order to fill the void that sport once filled. However, even though hedonism can be relatively okay, it's not necessarily the best way to deal with something. This is a major structural change to the spine where you take out an entire disc and stick two bones that aren't meant to be stuck together together. This is a guy who tried to go back three times. He then has an even bigger operation. What mentally could have led him to think he's ever going to be able to do that again? Well, that requires something quite remarkable. And this really comes into play our definitions of resilience, and mental toughness, toughness towards adversity. But what does that actually mean regarding sports psychology? Most sports psychologists will probably give the answer, I don't know. Mental toughness and resilience are being heavily played throughout the pop psychology books and literature. But the general meanings for some people is not the meanings we have in academia necessarily. And for, for instance, a sports team developing young players who are mentally tough and resilient, may mean doing something completely different to what the definition of what mental toughness and resilience is within psychology literature. However, it's one of those things, we know what it looks like when we see it. We know what mental toughness and resilience are when we see it. And the 2019 Masters, arguably, you could answer, that's an example of mental toughness and resilience in play and the glories of what happens when someone who goes through adversity comes out the other side. Likewise, in sport, that is not always the case. We also get a brief bit about Tiger's own development from his younger years as a child and the coaching he had. And you are dealing with adversity, you're dealing with criticism, you're dealing with hate. Your family's all you got at, at times. And Sam and Charlie and Tiger and the rest of his team, they are a family. And that's who we had to rely on through the tough times. That's who he could trust. And so what you saw there was just pure joy in being a father to your son and to your daughter. I think the kids are starting to understand, you know, that how much this, this game means to me and um, some of the things I've done in the game uh, prior to prior to this comeback. Um, they only knew that golf caused me a lot of pain. Tiger hugged his, his son Charlie after winning in 2019 at the Masters. That was a beautiful full circle, uh, reprising what he had done when he won in 97 and hugged his, his own father. And I know Tiger obviously was thinking about, you know, channeling what his dad had given uh, to him and giving the same or even more to Charlie. His dad, Earl Woods, was a taskmaster, but he did not impose limits. And that idea of if you know, it's like the Adidas slogan, nothing is impossible. And that was what Tiger Woods potentially was heavily influenced by. Um, I've always figured that why go to a tournament if you're not going there to try and win? There's really no point in even going. Um, that's the attitude I've had my entire life, and that's the attitude I will always have. And we see that Tiger Woods in himself uh, was a student of the game, and that he took a lot of confidence from looking back and past and looking at the history of the game and the past masters. And parallels were drawn between Ben Hagen, although very loose parallel, and that of Tiger Woods. And it stated that Ben Hagen was a influence towards Tiger Wood. Yet again, why are we focusing so much on this particular thing than focusing on the Tiger Woods? It is almost like it's just a footnote in Tiger Woods history rather than focusing purely on that for Tiger Woods on a movie about Tiger Woods. It was interesting to see how some of the, the golfing fraternity and the, the golfing old school people, what they thought of Tiger Woods coming up, being slightly cocky, overconfident. Uh, two, two things. I think if I play four solid rounds, uh, we'll go off to a good start today. Uh, if I can do that for three more days, I'll be very happy. And uh, a victory would be awfully nice too. A victory. Mm. Do you think, um, to me, that comes off as uh, a little cocky or brash, especially talking to the, you know, the other guys on tour that have been out here for years and years and years, and 
you know, certainly an incredible amateur record, but what do you say to those guys? Well, I... When you come out here, you're you know what I'm saying, your I'm first sure. pro tournament, and you say, you know, I can win. Golf in itself is a traditional sport. As a massively long tradition, it's an old sport, so to say. That although it has seen huge changes in recent years in fashion, in the way people play the game, the types of clubs they use, actually training for it, not just practicing, and the sports science and theories of play. Yet in many parts of the world, and many people have generally a more conservative traditional views regarding golf itself. Yet again, you always get those some people, hey, it's never been done before, the so-called haters, so to speak. In my opinion, what best way to shut them up than playing well and winning? Now, we must talk about the power of Tiger Woods' red shirt. He gave a brief mention about the red shirt that Tiger normally wears on his last day. And the reason being is that he won the Masters in the red shirt. But he has become synonymous with that night red shirt. In terms of lucky charms, these can be highly positive, highly confident things, providing that you are able to accept that if you do not have it and you lose, it's not because you didn't have it, uh, you shouldn't feel worried about not having that red shirt, or if that red shirt doesn't work, for instance, which is not because it's a lucky charm. It gave Tiger a lot of confidence, and that's cool. If, if, if a red shirt on the last day makes you more confident, then by all means, wear a red shirt. But in terms of the red shirt to the other people, it becomes synonymous with Tiger Woods. Whenever you see a computer game in Tiger Woods or in public Tiger Woods, you notice him with the red shirt. You don't notice him with other types of gear on. And it can become intimidating, intimidating to his opponents. And when people saw him rise through on the 2019 Masters, up that leaderboard, they felt pressured and it almost became a visual cue of that pressure, a visual cue of t what Tiger Woods can do. Being intimidated by a red shirt. Yeah, I know, that sounds awfully weird, but it can happen. Um, in the Olympics, in combat sports such as boxing and taekwondo and uh, in the two forms of wrestling, individuals are randomly assigned either red or blue to wear. When he studied the results of the bouts, he found that red and blue didn't win equally. What we actually found looking at the 2004 Olympics were that there were significantly more red winners than blue. And in these close contests, uh, red individuals won uh, nearly two thirds of the bouts. They took the video of the Taekwondo and in the original video you had one fighter in blue and one fighter in red. And they digitally manipulated that so that the original red fighter was fighting in blue. And when they showed this footage to Taekwondo referees, in the, in the original untouched footage, the red fighter was perceived to have scored more points. But in the manipulated film, it was again the red fighter who was judged to have more po points. Color signal that's there is manipulating the way in which these uh, contestants are being perceived. Here was the first evidence that the colour you wear is more than just a fashion choice. If you wear red, it could make you a winner. Effects to be there, but they are subtle effects. Simply wearing red doesn't mean you're going to be a winner. So there were subtle differences in the effect that colour was having on these cortisol responses. Even though all competitors seemed to show uh, an increase in cortisol levels in advance of the penalties, this seemed to be suppressed by those individuals that put on the red shirt. It suggests that uh, these individuals, by putting on the red shirt, may be going through an elevation in confidence and as a consequence this is suppressing their cortisol levels with cortisol being a marker of stress. And we know that the colour red for instance increases testosterone, increases aggressive behaviour potentially in individuals who are wearing it but also can scare people who don't wear it as such research has shown. It changes our perception of that individual. People perceive that player to be better, the player in the red to be better. Now to our eyes we have different cones with different colourings and we perceive through social means, through society, through years of evolution, red as a sign of anger, a warning sign, so to speak. It might increase their sense of anxiety. And whenever we're in a sense of anxiety, we perform less well on pretty much anything. Whereas the colour blue is calming, but also makes things seem to go quicker, the colour red has the opposite effect. It's not calming. And it also makes the perception of time go longer. Tiger's back gave a good account for reflection and rumination in terms of his recovery, although they could have gone into more detail as to why this is important. In retrospect, to see how I could have handled it better, a uh, decision like I made, made um, uh, a little bit better, you know, and either it's in life or on a golf course. 
The production followed a typical Brand Sky up. format with the use of HD slow mo which has become the woods. synonymous with the Sky production. Icon. With the use of the non-linear timeline, allowing Knowing us to everything we know, the injuries. Tiger Woods then and now. On a minor downer, there was one point where they showed the masters on the second to last day and showing the course and hearing the commentary over the course rather than showing the actual players playing. Now I can understand why you would do this especially if you haven't got the stock footage for it or you have to pay for it but they did have access to it so I understand they were trying to develop this sense of a battle of identity and wits but for me this just didn't work. Minimalist use of the 90s flash graphics, dust particle effects, and the amazing soundtrack. 118, 118. Helped to implicitly aid with the storytelling. In synopsis, Tiger Wood Back is an absorbing and candid documentary that offers a new perspective on a sporting icon. It offers insights into his psyche that, are not f that we weren't fully aware of to begin with. Now, there's not in the media or in the general public, which is spectacular because we don't have him here. He hasn't physically taken part in the documentary, but, um, unless you include the B-roll as being physically taken part. But he has no influence on the documentary. They didn't sit down and talk to him. And to get this insight is actually very difficult to do without the driving narrative of the person who it is aimed on. As a result, it's a success. It's been given comparisons to The Last Dance. Both focus on culturally significant individuals whose influence and reputation transcended their sports and both were the centre of key triumphs late in their respective careers while offering a broader look back at highlights and lowlights. Though director Nick German has pointed out these similarities are entirely coincidental. What the film did do was focus in depth specifically on the 2019 Masters. However, it did give details on him from the past, which then allowed me to expand upon utilizing sports science. And there was quite a fair bit of sports science thrown in, ran subtly and secretly. The graphics were spartan, but were noticeable and added a feel, and quite strangely, added to the story as well. The story of Tiger Woods and his battles with adversity from his downfall from grace before coming back to win the major in front of his family. All in all, I give Tiger Woods back a score of 96.55 <laughs>